so uh, my name is Victor Ionescu. Um, I've been working at MSG doing SAP development for about four and a half uh, years now. Um, as what I already said, I'm going to be hosting this first session, which in general terms I would call um, a session about enterprise user experience. Um, so in that sense, the title might be a little bit misleading, but you will uh, come to understand from where the title comes uh, as we progress through the presentation. So the idea is, uh, especially for those of you who were here also last year, um, we wanted to make a continuation. Uh, following up on uh, the theoretical foundation we laid last year, we discussed, if you remember, the SAP UX strategy, uh, talking about how uh, technologies have evolved and user experience has evolved at SAP over the decades. Um, anyway, it was a rather theoretical um, approach. So we said, okay, this time let's make it a little bit more practical and bring something new, bring our own experience into it. Um, so we don't, uh, talking about these new technologies, we don't consider ourselves uh, experts, at least uh, not yet, but still we're getting there. And uh, what we wanted to do is share some of the, the experiences we've had while working with uh, these technologies. So basically the session will be uh, split up in two parts. Uh, first introductory part, uh, which is more theoretical, where we will uh, discuss mainly enterprise user experience, the way it is nowadays, where we see some uh, potential problems uh, and some, uh, uh, likewise some potential solutions. What are the trends that, we, uh, that are visible already showing that uh, the user experience is changing. And afterwards, we will take a shift and look at it from the, the SAP perspective, discussing uh, solutions uh, and technologies that have been uh, delivered by SAP to uh, help refresh this user experience. And this is where we want uh, especially to discuss about uh, particularly what kind of experiences we've had while in working with uh, these technologies. And we'll also take a glimpse into the actual applications. Um, I would uh, call them uh, prototypes that we've been building. So I hope you uh, all enjoy it. Um, so, first of all, what do we all understand under the term user experience? I think it's basically uh, easy to say. It's just a set of all aspects that are related to how the end user interacts with a particular product. In our case, well, it's a software product. Um, and the most important aspect is how easy it is to use, so intuitiveness. And um, if you haven't had the chance to read this uh, little graphic until now, uh, there's an IT expert and a customer, and the expert is uh, telling the customer, okay, your user requirements have 400 features. You do realize that no normal human being will be able to handle this complexity. The answer, ah, oh, you're right, I'd better ask, add easy to use to the list. Uh, we think we can all agree that it's uh, not that simple to, uh, to design a, a, a product that has a, a, some high standards of usability. And this is basically the main, uh, the core aspect that we're going to be discussing uh, today. Let me give you another example. Uh, we have a steering wheel. I've uh, added some adjectives that I would use to describe it. I would say it's quite simple. It doesn't have any unnecessary buttons uh, and features. So uh, as a consequence, it should also be rather intuitive uh, and easy to use. You could jump right in and drive away. And uh, my personal opinion, I think it's also quite uh, good looking, especially if you compare it with this one. Uh, this is in fact a steering, a steering wheel of a Formula One car. Obviously a Formula One car is way more complicated, so it has to provide a lot more features. It's complex and the uh, clear uh, consequences, uh, it cannot be intuitive, or can it? And uh, if we also discuss the looks, I think uh, the one on the left is the clear winner here. So perhaps you're... Maybe not. 
perhaps you've already guessed the, the analogy here. On the left, sa uh, left side is what we would call uh, consumer-grade user experience, while on the right side is the enterprise user experience uh, in our days. I say in our days because we do expect it to change uh, in the coming years. So then, I've asked myself, why is it that this complexity exists? Um, does it really have to be this way and is it normal to request from a customer that he sends his employees to a one-month one training uh, in order to be even able to use such a, such a system due to this complexity? And uh, history has shown us a lot of examples um, of, soft, of failures of software development projects, um, products being abandoned for failing to meet even a minimum user uh, experience uh, ex uh, expectations of the end users. And one particular example that I've listed here has been featured in many headlines. It's the failure of uh, Avon, the Avon company, I think you've heard about it, uh, of implementing an order management solution, um, a project that has cost about $125 million, and that was uh, abandoned in last December because the employees of Avon started to resign, they quit their jobs, because it became a lot more difficult after implementing this new solution, because of the complexity of this product. So Avon just had to go back and go, uh, go to the old solution. So, so now uh, you see these uh, examples of failures and we still haven't uh, answered the question, why is it that this, uh, these softwares are so complex? Well, I think the generally accepted answer here is that there really are use, use cases and there are expert users that require the complexity. They appreciate the fact that they can tweak any, uh, every last single knob in the system and adjust the features uh, to what, uh, exactly what they require. However, this does not consider one important aspect. And this is that these complex use cases only make up about 20% of the entire uh, system usage. So what about the other 80%? because we definitely won't be able to get rid of that 20%. Though that solution has to remain, uh, it's going to have the same user experience, but we can target the other 80%. <clears throat> so the obvious question to ask yourself is, what can we do to improve uh, user experience? Well, uh, the literature has uh, quite a few uh, proposals on how to improve user experience. I'm not, this isn't really the scope of the current uh, uh, session, but I've uh, enumerated some just for the sake of completeness. There's something called user-centered design, where the end user is always at the kernel of your entire software development life cycle. You, keep, uh, you progress in uh, uh, small iterations and uh, get constant feedback from your end user, making sure that you really build what is needed by him. This is just uh, a, a new methodology for solving uh, problems, which perhaps already exists for a few years now. There's another trend called the consumerization of IT. Perhaps you've heard of it. It promotes a few uh, important aspects, like making uh, applications, uh, designing them for one single use case, so making them do one single thing, but do it right, and make it easy for the customer to do his job by using those applications. So it's kind of a shift in the paradigm of building applications. We don't want to have one monolithic solution for all use cases. We, use, we build multiple applications, each one for one use case. And doing so, uh, well, we obviously don't have this feature richness, but what becomes more important is uh, integration between the applications. And I think this is a fact that has been uh, borrowed from the applications that we use in our private lives. Look at those uh, Facebook and Google apps and look at the fact that they are easy and they integrate seamlessly with each other. So this is uh, something that I think now is being targeted also in the enterprise world. Okay, now this has all been theory. I also wanted to check if uh, this is also being applied in practice. So
So uh, I've looked at some, some surveys, I've, I've done a little bit of research. Uh, how many of you have heard of gamification, enterprise gamification? Okay, so there's quite a few of you. It's one other uh, trend that promotes uh, basically making work fun. And it's uh, based on the idea that uh, people are more productive if they have fun while doing this. So um, some sample ideas is just rewarding your employees if they uh, do their tasks, letting them uh, interact with each other through uh, social networking, and also perhaps uh, stimulating a competition. This is a graph depicting the Google Trends uh, for the term gamification. I think it's clear that it's on really on a, a steep uh, climb here. This is 2011 and this year is 2014. Um, one other uh, example of survey done by Forrester among many enterprise, uh, enterprises has said that about 80% of the interview uh, enterprises intend to introduce something that is called bring your own device, a program that's called bring your own device, through which every employee can uh, come from home with his own smartphone, his own tablet, and use it for doing his, uh, his tasks at work. So obviously enterprises uh, expect uh, a series of gains from this, starting with perhaps the least important one, which is uh, the fact that they uh, cut down on some costs for buying that hardware, uh, but continuing with the fact that with such mobile uh, modern devices you can use more modern applications with a better user experience. Uh, and uh, last but not least, you have remote access to your information. So this promotes enterprise mobility. And this is something that we're all um, trying to achieve here. Now, uh, Concluding this uh, rather theoretical part, um, I would say it's obvious that we really are at the turning point here. We've noticed it, so has SAP, and the solutions that SAP uh, has offered in order to help improve user experience are visible on multiple dimensions. For example, we have a technology stack that in the last couple of years has been uh, renewing with increasing frequency. So you have new releases on every level, starting from the database with SAP HANA uh, to up until the UI with the Fiori and UI5 that we'll be discussing. Um, so new releases are coming really, uh, really frequently. The SAP's UX strategy that we were discussing last year, which uh, uh, aims to refresh everything in, in the SAP business suit and help the customer also build his own uh, applications. And last but not least, there's also a change in uh, the way in which software is supposed to be uh, delivered to the customer. Meaning, um, actually this is the point that we're going to take on first next, because we now want to uh, make this shift and look at, uh, at things from an SAP perspective. And this is uh, the, uh, the place where we're going to be discussing SAP Rapid Deployment Solutions. It's a little bit right here. All right, so before we discuss the, these Rapid Deployment Solutions, <laughs> let's take a step back and uh, look at the triangle that I have behind me. It depicts a classical problem of software development projects, um, meaning you always have these constraints of having a project in time, uh, what's there, in cost, and uh, with uh, the, uh, the scope or the quality that you've uh, proposed to achieve from start. So these are constraints that, uh, that contradict each other and they compete with each other and it's kind of the job of uh, project management to keep a balance between them. And I think uh, this is one of the points where uh, SAP Rapid Deployment Solutions comes, uh, very, uh, comes in very handy because it promotes a new way of uh, deploying uh, standard software, of doing these implementation projects. Mainly by uh, having software uh, in smaller packages than we are uh, 
normally used perhaps in the SAP uh, environment. Uh, so they stop promoting um, a project that will last in a couple of years, that maybe that's how we're used to it, uh, or even months, and the, the normal timeline is a couple of weeks in this situation. So the rapid deployment solution, uh, every RDS is basically a package cons consisting of four things. You buy a license for uh, that software, it's basically a standard solution. You uh, get uh, content, which is on one hand some sample content to customize your solution, and something called development accelerators. Depending on the situation, this can be different things. We will see uh, what this actually means in our case with the user experience. Then there is the enablement part, where you as a customer get all the document documentation and know-how transfer uh, for you to uh, start off and do the implementation of the project. And there's a service part, which is either performed by SAP or by, by an SAP partner, in which you also uh, consult the client and do these uh, design thinking workshops. Now this is a term that I would like uh, for you to uh, keep in mind, and I'm also very curious if you've heard of design thinking. <coughs> there's one, okay. Uh, <laughs> Design thinking is um, an approach to solving problems, so it's a very a general term. It, it was promoted by a company called uh, IDEO, although the idea existed long before. Um, and it has now been taken up by SAP and pushed especially with these rapid deployment solutions. Um, there's one important aspect here because up until now, enterprise solutions, what has been uh, the measurement, uh, the metrics for measuring the quality of an enterprise solution? Well, I say it was feature richness. How many functionalities can this solution offer me? Well, uh, an approach based on design thinking brings a new uh, factor into the equation, the human factor. So uh, it aims, as it's uh, defined, to match what is desired by the human, so the end user, with what is really viable from a business perspective and of course what is technically possible or feasible. So there's a, an entire philosophy around design thinking. There are um, universities teaching courses on design thinking and if it sounds interesting to you, uh, I really suggest you Google it. Um, anyway, coming back to these uh, rapid development solutions, which is what is really important to mention is uh, the main uh, advantage, advantage is that you buy uh, a fixed scope, a product with a fixed scope at a fixed cost, and you also have a really uh, good approximation of how long it will take to implement that solution. So the time frame is predictable. As I said, it's somewhere in a couple of weeks. Um, perhaps you've asked yourself, okay, why are we discussing RDS? This is a user experience session. Well, there are multiple RDS packages uh, listed on the SAP Marketplace. There is, in fact, there are three uh, packages related to user experience. And uh, this uh, Fiori Design RDS, this is something that we're going to uh, simulate today. Uh, we were going to imagine that we're a customer implementing a uh, Fiori Design RDS. Uh, as defined in their uh, functionality list, such a Fiori Design RDS gives the customer a set of, uh, of benefits. Uh, someone comes and, comes and helps uh, them set up their SAP landscape so that they can build their own Fiori applications. They get some uh, sample uh, tools and appli applications so that they don't have to start off from scratch while building these applications. Uh, they get the knowledge uh, transfer and the set of Fiori Design principles that they need to build these apps. And uh, this is all, as, as I said, set to uh, be implementable in uh, about maximum four, four weeks. So now uh, I have not made any introduction regarding Fiori, but just to be sure that we're all on the same uh, page, I'm going to uh, discuss about this uh, briefly also. So Fiori was uh, the initial name given to a set of uh, standard web applications built with uh, having a great user experience built for some use cases that SAP has seen are being used the most. Some of those 80% use cases. 
and uh, these have been bundled in waves, so wave one, wave two, and then um, due to their success, um, SAP has generalized the term to, all, to represent strictly what uh, strictly the principles that are needed to be obeyed uh, if you want to, be, uh, to implement your own uh, Fiori applications. So the principles are listed over there. Uh, I encourage you to also read them uh, on SAP's uh, homepage. But uh, there are two important ones that I want to discuss right away. So the first one is role-based uh, applications. So remember what we said at the consumerization of IT, that we want to have one application that does one thing but does it well. This also kind of correlates to that because we have applications for one specific role and the user will only get to see those applications that are relevant for him. Responsive uh, relates to the fact that these applications are meant to look the same and work the same uh, no matter if I uh, use a tablet or if I use a, uh, a smartphone so it adapts to that uh, viewport. <clears throat> now, as I've said, we want to imagine that we are at a customer. So this is also, uh, I also have to do a little bit of introduction on, let's say, the business case. We are at a customer that is um, an insurance company that wishes to refresh his user experience. And the particular business case that we want to handle is, let's say, uh, a manufacturing company comes to that customer, to that insurance company and says, okay, uh, I have a factory in Cluj and I want to insure it against fire hazards. Now, in this situation, the typical life cycle that you would go through is, on one hand, you would have to, uh, the insurer would have to evaluate that uh, object, obviously. So someone from the insurance company would go over to the factory, uh, look at how thick the walls are, if it's fireproof, if it isn't, and all the other aspects. Then he would go back to his desk uh, and uh, write up an offer for, a, for an insurance policy, which, if accepted, uh, will become active, such that the factory is then uh, insured. Then comes the customer, the manufacturing company, into play. And what he has to do, well, he has to pay his premiums on a periodical basis. He, want, he may also want to check his account balance. And uh, what we also introduced into the business case is that he has to periodically report the value of his uh, stocks, of his inventory. You can, uh, I like to uh, do an analogy here. Uh, you get your gas bills in the inbox every month with an estimation of how much gas you probably consume. And then, uh, after three months, someone from the gas company comes and reads to see what you've actually uh, needed. So this actual reading is the reporting that has to be performed also in this case in order to know the actual value of the inventory because also the insured sum uh, varies accordingly. So this is just a brief uh, introduction uh, that uh, we need in order to uh, go on with the use case. The good, uh, the good news is the entire life cycle is supported by the SAP for insurance suite, also with a, with a product that MSG has been uh, implementing, which is uh, the ISL stands for, so uh, industry and specialty lines. Uh, perhaps the not so good part is that due to this complexity, uh, the user experience might be a little bit degraded and that is precisely what we're targeting now. We want to improve, help the customer improve his user experience. So how does, we, let's say we've talked about, through it with the customer, how does uh, the solution landscape look like? Oh, we imagine we want to build a set of Fiori apps that are role-based, exactly for those uh, use cases that we need. And uh, we will give both the insurer and the uh, policy holder, in this case the manufacturing company, access to these applications through one central homepage, which is the Fiori Launchpad, and where each one of them, depending on their role, will also only see those applications that uh, are uh, related to them. In fact, let me stop right here. 
Yeah. You sure you look smart, babe? No. So this is the Fiori Launchpad. What you see, uh, okay, let me, uh, who of you has never seen the Launchpad before? Cool, then it's interesting. <laughs> uh, um, so what we have here, these, these squares are the so-called tiles that are just shortcuts to basically anything. Um, if we take this MSG system style, uh, it's a hard link to an URL to our homepage. Um, on the other hand, you can very easily link uh, uh, Fiori apps into the launchpad. And the idea is that you would have uh, a system administrator define these tiles and assign them to the roles that are uh, relevant. Um, and then when I log in, depending on my role, I would see only those apps that are relevant for me. Now in our case, in order to make the demonstration a little bit easier, we've just created uh, two groups, insurer app and insurance customer apps. Um, just to have them in one place. Now the idea is, I also as an end user have the possibility to uh, personalize this uh, home page a little bit for me. And in order to do so, um, I can uh, navigate to the catalog which lists all the available uh, tiles in the system and uh, I can just pick one <coughs> and it has uh, been uh, added to my home page automatically. So this one, if it's right with you over here, is the one that we've just added. Also, perhaps you've noticed some tiles have statical descriptions that don't change. Some are more, a little bit more fancy, more eye candy. Uh, the idea is that you have dynamic tiles that get updated by calling uh, services in the back end and getting the content and, uh, for example, displaying your live uh, account balance, because that was one of those points that we had on our list. Okay. Now, we've discussed the launchpad. Let's move on to the actual applications. Um, and if you see something marked with, uh, with an exclamation mark, that means, okay, we've tried it. I think it's a good idea to, if you do it uh, the same way. The first one, keep it simple. Uh, we said Fiori apps are not meant for those 20% use cases that are really complicated. Do not try to get 100 fields into a Fiori app. It won't work. It's not uh, meant for that. So keep it simple. And uh, yeah, also don't try to build everything from scratch. Use these existing uh, application templates. They, these are the ones that uh, I mentioned the term development accelerators before. Well. These are some uh, templates that you use that act as a frame for your entire application. SAP has specified in their guidelines a set of um, several types of applications that you probably they cover most of your needs. If you really need uh, another form factor for your application, go ahead and build one new. But most of the cases, uh, a process app, which is kind of like a wizard, or a shopping cart, an approval app, is going to be more than enough. Okay, um, for those of you who don't know, Fiori apps um, are actually just, it's just a fancy name for JavaScript web applications that are built using the UI5 uh, library uh, developed by SAP. And knowing this, and knowing the fact that we're going to use these predefined app templates, if you really want to customize them, you have to add your own views into those templates. And to do so, we're getting a little bit more technical here, um, you have, for example, several options. You can define these views in an XML format. That means it's a declarative approach. You write XML code uh, describing exactly how you want the layout to work. It's great. Uh, if you don't need really, uh, I don't know, some fancy functionalities that cannot be done simply through uh, an XML definition. But it's great because it clearly separates 
your layout logic from your orchestration <coughs> logic. Uh, the other, uh, one of the other uh, options is defining the view uh, in an imperative approach through JavaScript code, the way you would perhaps do it uh, know, in Java Swing, uh, where you just create the content, place it, uh, so you have full control as a developer where you want and how you want them to work. This is the other approach, obviously, is uh, here's the danger that you couple the layout a little bit with the orchestration. Now, also discussing a little bit more about how these things work, uh, these UI5 apps are strongly uh, built around an MVC architecture, meaning that for every view you will have a controller attached that acts as kind of an event handler. So it catches every uh, event triggered by the view, handles it, and there's one more uh, item, obviously, the model, which uh, helps in uh, with establishing the connectivity to the backend. Now, this, these models are meant to be connected to, basically, to an OData service in the back. If you don't know uh, what OData is, I'll be coming to that uh, shortly. The idea is it's just a communication protocol. And OData services, uh, the OData format was not uh, specified by SAP, it was in fact specified by Microsoft. And you could, you could in theory have uh, such services uh, having any kind of business backend. But since we are discussing SAP now, um, you would typically have a few solutions. On one hand, you can have a HANA box uh, below the UI uh, application. Uh, and I think we're also going to have uh, some examples of that in the third session. Um, but perhaps the most common situation is you do have uh, currently a business suit and you want a new fancy uh, user experience for it. So uh, you have to integrate them somewhere, uh, somehow, and this is where NetWeaver Gateway comes into play. It acts as an integration middleware. On one hand, it connects to, the, these, uh, to this business suit functionality, it pro provides some adapters and generates ABAP code to connect to remote function calls, BAPIs, web services. And on the other hand, it exposes them in the form of all data services. <clears throat> One more uh, aspect that uh, I would like to point out here, um, keep those all data models simple. So we're all about simplicity today. Uh, do not let complexity from the business suit propagate uh, all the way to the UI. If you have a complex uh, business model, you will not be able to handle it in JavaScript code. Just define the OData model to match your requirements on the user interface, and uh, then handle it in the NetWeaver Gateway implementation. It's, it's easier in ABAP, it might still be a little bit uh, tricky, but uh, this is probably the best way to do it. This is also what SAP recommends. Okay, now, uh, I promise to discuss all data uh, briefly. It's uh, commonly known as uh, SQL for the web. So it's a communication protocol where every entity you have uh, in, your, in, the, in your business model is uniquely identified by an uh, URL. You can query it using uh, standard HTTP verbs like get, post, and put. Uh, put. Uh, it supports aggregation of entities. And I've listed here the correspondent between an, a normal SQL query and, uh, and the uh, equivalent uh, all data query. But in fact, uh, I'm going to try and, uh, and uh, illustrate this live. So what you have here is the URL identifying the service. Uh, what's uh, coming afterwards are the uh, individual entities. So if you don't put anything in there, you'll be just going to get a listing of, uh, of the individual entities. If you do uh, mention one of these entities, you will get a listing of all entries. And then uh, it starts to, to get fun. You can do a count, eight entries. You can do uh, something that is really important when doing paging. Perhaps you want the, only the first entry. Okay. 
or perhaps you want one entry but uh, you want to skip the first two. So you have uh, quite a, a few options here. These are specified in the OData uh, definition. You can also uh, do querying just like you would with in the normal WHERE clause of an uh, SQL query. Or you can uniquely identify records by uh, providing their URL. So you, if you do spec uh, specify that ID, you will get particularly that entry. And in this case, we have an entity called document that we're going to see in one of the Fiori apps later. Um, as it happens, one document can have multiple usages, which is uh, another entity in the business model. So it's in a one-to-many relationship. And if I want to see those documents, I just add uh, the usage entity in the back and I get them all listed. In fact, I think this one only has one entry. Exactly. So that's about, uh, that all sums it up regarding OData. Some uh, consider it to be really, uh, really nice. Some others say that it exposes details of the underlying model, which might be a security issue. But nonetheless, it's, uh, it's used in SAP solutions. And now we're going to be uh, going back to our initial uh, business case. And we said that uh, at the start of the business case, what needs to happen is for an employee of the insurance company to go over to the factory and see uh, well, how that building looks like, uh, how thick the walls are, and, uh, and other similar attributes of the, of the factory in order to be able to do a good evaluation. Let's talk to working. No? <laughs> That's what happens when you do live demos. This is the one that your uh, employee of the insurance company would go uh, on site and say, okay, let's uh, look at this building. What we have here is uh, a set of buildings that we've already evaluated um, with an ID that I can then use and sit at my desk and uh, I'll, I'll take the building and have it already in my uh, insurance uh, business suit, so in the back end, and just issue an offer. But in fact, what I would like to do now is create a new one. So we have here a set of different uh, attributes. I think it's best if I do it this way. All right, match the uh, Google Maps plugin. What you see above is that we would like application. Uh, so, as I said, we're using some development accelerators. I, I see the people who build the app smiling in the back. <laughs> okay, so you, you, see, <laughs> uh, you see some other attributes that can be set here. The construction year, the roofing type, um, and uh, the area, the number of floors, and this can probably go on uh, like that. Successful. Okay. <laughs> and uh, what we've also added is the capability to uh, attach a photo, right? You want to take a, a, a photo of the building. conference. So I, I'm now in read-only mode 
and I can see the attached uh, elements. So you see we've had quite a bit of fun about building these. Um, these really are fun, and, but also challenging uh, when it comes to the integration aspect. that we'd like to mention uh, as a takeaway. Uh, just like any other uh, development project, software development project, you want to make sure that uh, your software stays consistent and, and doesn't fail. We can do this uh, also in the case of UI5 applications. You have two main things. On the UI level, you have the possibility to test uh, the interface without backend connectivity. So this is uh, where I would like for you to uh, remember the mock server, which is part of the UI5 library. It basically, if uh, activated, it intercepts any backend calls and provides the application with some mock data that you can use to do some very basic tests. Make sure you're, at least you have, don't have any syntax errors. So you would do this on your local development machine before you upload it to the repository. For the backend services, you also have uh, uh, an option meaning the NetWeaver Gateway uh, client. It's a transaction on the uh, application server, about application server, where you can define regression tests. Uh, what we mean by that is uh, those tests that make sure that the functionality that once worked uh, doesn't get, uh, well, yeah, it, it still works after some new uh, some changes. And you can do this by uh, specifying the input to the whole data service and specifying the expected output. And you can uh, schedule uh, recurring tests, so these uh, to, to make sure that, uh, that, that no new errors occur. One uh, other important uh, aspect, perhaps the most important one, um, is application responsiveness. When you, when you do uh, invest the time to build some uh, fancy applications with modern user experience, it's important <coughs> to have it responsive. Um, what I mean by that, you should never let the application ever uh, freeze or be lagging because there's a backend uh, call occurring right now. So always make sure to use asynchronous uh, backend calls. <coughs> also, you have the possibility with UI5 to only update uh, particular sections of the application. So do that, because the data that comes from the backend, I'm sure, only affects a uh, section of the application. And use these uh, loader uh, UI controls to, to signal to the end user that there's something happening uh, in the backend right now. If it's possible, if uh, in your case we've experienced with it, do some preloading of the data transparently to the user even before he even uh, needs it. So, so just that you have it uh, at your disposal when it should be displayed. And one other thing that uh, we haven't tried out yet, but uh, you should always, uh, before deployment, minimize your JavaScript code. So that these are uh, tools available that will uh, shrink the name of your variables, they eliminate uh, new line and page breaks, such that your entire code is not readable anymore, but that doesn't matter. At least the size is a lot smaller, so it can be downloaded a lot quicker. Now also, regarding uh, responsiveness of the application, it's important to understand how uh, rendering here works in the case, for example, of an, a simple table in uh, UI5. This is this can be customized, but by default, what UI5 does, let's say you want to, uh, what did we have? We had factories. Let's say you want to uh, list all the factories. UI5 first buries the, the whole data service and asks, how many entries do you have? I guess for knowing how to render it. Uh, and then only it uh, queries for the actual entries. Now, it's important to know that NetWeaver Gateway, by default, does not offer any caching functionality. So it's just an integration middleware. What does that mean? Well, first hand, uh, Gateway is asked, how many entries do you have? I don't know, let me check. I'll get them all, count them. Okay, now give me uh, all your entries. 
Okay, I'll get them all and then pass them to the device. So you get the problem here. That there is no caching and um, the way we understood it, it's not uh, intended to have any caching. So you would have to implement one of your own uh, if needed. Um, it gets even worse. Uh, uh, we've talked about this paging functionality. So let's say you, uh, your application first queries the, the, for the first 10 entries. What does NetBeaver gateway do? It gets all uh, 100 of them and returns the uh, first 10. Then the user would switch on to the next page. So the application requires the next 10 entries. All 100 are loaded and the next 10 are returned. Then you would uh, query perhaps and do some filtering. Give me only those with a value above uh, 100. Get them all and uh, see which one is larger than uh, 100. So one possible solution here would be to have all this processing pushed all the way back into the business suit and to make sure you have uh, interfaces here that by default uh, enable paging, enable filtering by various uh, conditions. Unfortunately, we are dealing with legacy solutions and most of the time it's not the case. So. Uh, you have to come up with solutions of your own. Your own. We've tried them, you can try them, and none of them are the best, but you have to find kind of a balance between uh, performance and then cost of implementation and others. For example, you can do your own caching. What this does is make things a lot more complicated because you have to make sure you're not working with obsolete data. You have to make sure when you're right, uh, doing a write access that you're also accessing the uh, um, refreshing the data in the cache and the backend and other simple situations that really do not make it any easier. <coughs> One other solution which maybe in some situations is feasible is to deploy the NetWeaver gateway on the same machine as uh, your business backend. This is only possible if you have one machine and perhaps you think that it's not the best idea because typically your NetWeaver gateway is your entry point into the uh, landscape and it's situated into a, in a demilitarized zone so that from a security perspective you would have to uh, expose your entire uh, system just to uh, make this work. Uh, so these are our best trials. Uh, if you come up with uh, better ideas, I'm glad uh, to discuss them. Perhaps this is one of the topics that we can discuss at the, in the coffee break. Um, what I still want, uh, want to show is the set of uh, applications that we've also, uh, other applications that we've built. <coughs> right. Now, this uh, application uses a really standard uh, template, which is called the split app. And um, why it's called like that? Because on, left, on the left hand side you have a master view with just a header of every entry, and if you do uh, click on it, you get the details. This is a, an interesting uh, topic here. If you would launch this application from a mobile device, you would get just that master view. Clicking on one entry would navigate you to the details view, and then you would go back. Uh, if you would launch it on on a desktop computer, you would get both the uh, master and the detail view rendered all the time. This is kind of the middle solution. So here we have uh, account balance uh, that has been connected to another uh, SAP module, the collections and disbursements module. And you would, uh, if you would have multiple insurances, these would go into different accounts. So what we have here is uh, fire insurance, cargo insurance if you are a company also doing uh, transports and you wish to have these insured. And one final application that I, I would uh, present is for that value reporting that I was telling you about, so the gas bill, right? What you get here is uh, you have to report your real value inventory and you have the specific period for which you report them. 
you remember perhaps we had documents and we had those <coughs> images of documents. What you see here are uh, the documents, and if I can manage to click that question mark. No. <laughs> yeah, right? This is a new topic that we have to uh, add to our list. Don't use question marks as buttons. <laughs> ah, I think I've got it, yeah. Um, so these are the usages. You've seen that we only had one usage for, uh, for the document. And uh, afterwards, the uh, pencils are, aren't uh, better, better either. Uh, afterwards, you go to another screen. So you see this is a kind of a custom build application. This doesn't have any uh, standard frame around it. We've built it from scratch against our own guidelines. Um, but you would uh, report the, your inventory for the period 1st of June, 1st of July. And then um, I was talking, talking to you about that cargo insurance. Now, suppose you have this factory in Prue and want to transport some really valuable goods to uh, Munich. Let's do it like that. This is also uh, using some Google location services. And note that on the lower hand side, um, there's there's a loader appearing and disappearing really fast. That's because there's a backend call happening which uh, checks do I have any insurance policy that covers this kind of a transport. Um, if I'm going to Munich and I'm not really inspired, I would go through Ukraine now, and uh, you'll see why you'll see why this is important because specifically in this uh, line of business. Uh, a lot of risk evaluation is performed and that kind of logic can be quite uh, complex and this is also the transition to our uh, next session uh, where you will uh, get a presentation on how such uh, complex business rules can be modeled. We've actually integrated this application uh, with, uh, with a business rule in the back end. Um, And we've uh, mocked that logic in the back end such that if you use a, a value above 1,000, you get that uh, insurance policy so that you can submit the document. Now, um, I'm going to leave it at this place because uh, Christian is going to take over in the, ne the next session and show you how this risk evaluation would actually happen uh, in, in real life. Um, Okay, now I only have uh, a few more slides. On one hand, this is a thing that we have to, uh, to have on our list. These are all new solutions, uh, and you have to do, uh, take this into account when developing the new products. On the one hand, we have new features coming in at a high frequency, so this is a good thing. On the other hand, keep, into, uh, keep in mind that uh, with new features, perhaps older ones can become obsolete. And also perhaps uh, current features are a little bit unstable and uh, you need some bug fixes. So that's the situation, but uh, nonetheless we're happy to have uh, these technologies. And finally, just to draw up a conclusion, I think uh, we can all agree we are really at a, at a turning point with regard to enterprise user experience. Um, since we're all in the, in, the, in the field of SAP development, what I can only give as uh, advice is to embrace new technologies and uh, take them into your companies and take advantage of them because there's a real market out there for them and uh, yeah, have fun <coughs> with them. <laughs> Alright, thanks. If there are any questions. You were thinking about asking a question, no? <laughs> One question, what other problems do you get into while you are doing apps? Um, yeah, this is kind of, you know, when you have uh, a movie and afterwards you can show what didn't go wrong, right? Uh, on one hand, what we've noticed is that uh, maybe we weren't able to 
find it to figure it out, but NetWeaver Gateway doesn't really handle uh, these namespace prefixes very well. We have a namespace slash ISL from our product slash, and I've told you that the NetWeaver Gateway generates code. So what it would do is it would generate code with syntax errors in it. This, as I said, perhaps we didn't uh, do it right, but uh, I think there's there's uh, there's a bug fix still missing over there. And uh, one other thing, which for me was quite amazing, you know these on-screen uh, keyboards. You know that you can uh, split them, okay? And let me see if I can get that. Yeah, apparently no one tested this uh, using the split uh, keyboard. I had this uh, by default uh, split and I just couldn't believe what, what was uh, going wrong. If you, if you join them, it's all perfect. Uh, once again, a box fix missing. Listen, so just keep it into, uh, in, in your mind because uh, this is the way it is at the current state. Other questions? I'm sure you're going to have a lot more in the coffee break, right? Okay, well, if there are no other questions, then thank you very much. I hope you had fun. yourselves but uh, didn't ask them right now because they're not um, based on this session. How come did we uh, use these examples based on insurance branch, on the insurance branch? Um, because we are, as an industry, we are uh, confronting projects that are 70% around the insurance and reinsurance branch, because that's why. Um, did we um, use these examples before in other conferences? No. Um, how come um, we do this research or how come uh, we try these things? Because we want to uh, have our employees prepare, not only our top employees, not, um, but also our uh, new uh, colleagues that have the, uh, the chance to, to get in touch with these new technologies. We have invested uh, a lot of time, we have invested a lot of money uh, in order to be prepared and to um, confront challenges when they come from our customers. That's why both our business consultants, our technical consultants, our architects are uh, ready to, to solve these issues. Um, yeah, so how, how, how do you think? Should we take a coffee break now? Probably we have, we have the courage to we'll ask Victor more questions. Or I have a question here. Ah, you don't have yeah, a I would have a question for Victor. What is the development environment for this theory? Perhaps? Uh, yeah, well, uh, I, I, I initially had that on my, uh, on my list, on my <laughs> slide, but uh, time is limited. So it's uh, Eclipse. You can basically do everything in Eclipse. Mm -hmm. uh, even the modeling of the old data services, you can do them in Eclipse. Mm -hmm. So slowly but surely, you're not going to need your uh, sub tool, uh, mm -hmm. your sub log on. And uh, I have another question. So if this uh, this is Eclipse, so if you develop an Eclipse, why would you choose sub theory and not uh, the UI5 development, which they, which you can develop also in in the classical ABAP workbench, and uh, why would you choose it before, for example, the Sybase product, the unwired platform? Well, I think uh, if you compare it with Sybase, uh -huh. I think it's a different uh, target for a little bit. Now, Fiori, I think it's, it's just, uh, these are UI5 apps with a Fiori uh, design principles that, <coughs> these are all those five principles that I've listed, and uh, they're building them now to be uh, responsive, and they're building them to really be deployable on multiple uh, devices. 
So uh, Sybase, if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, is uh, the uh, that's SAP mobile uh, mm -hmm. solution, but uh, perhaps it comes to, it overlaps a little bit on the functionality, but uh, this is the one that is being pushed right now. So. I don't see why not. <laughs> so it's rather a marketing decision then. It, it does have uh, a real uh, appeal to the customer, that, that's for sure. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions? Oh, that's right. Um, <coughs> our example to base. That's a question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Technically speaking, the, <coughs> the theory is an add-on implemented to the about the stack. That's right. There's also server-side uh, an, an add-on required, I guess. It's it's also server-side. What is the role of this add-on in relation with the uh, well, presentation? Uh, we have so the, the connectivity in the database and the... The add-on, uh, there are two parts. You have it, uh, an add-on for the design time. So in the phase you're, in which you're building the application, you have services in your NetWeaver uh, server exposed that you can then use in Eclipse. So in order to work outside of the, uh, of the normal platform, that's where you would use uh, these services. There's also uh, a functionality for the runtime. So it's the entire environment in which the applications are, are running. Uh, in fact, uh, this is an, an interesting thing. If you, you build these uh, UI5 applications, which are just JavaScript web apps, so you have to deploy them somewhere. Uh, actually, they are being uploaded to the, uh, to the HubUp uh, server in the repository and stored as BSP applications, so business server pages. These are just uh, the containers in which these are placed, and at runtime, in fact, you just have those JavaScript uh, artifacts uh, running. Um, yeah. So, like I said, um, uh, those examples we try to offer in the future to our customers. We already are um, next to the viewers and uh, we hope that they uh, will uh, respond um, in, in, the, in the strategy that we will uh, also have productive projects with these uh, technologies. Like Victor said, they are actually they are um, in construction, like, like, like the, and uh, probably there are some minor bugs that need to be fixed. But service hacks come uh, pretty often, and uh, I'm sure that uh, next year, the next years, all of the web projects will be based on these technologies. Good. So thank you. Um, after the break, Christian will uh, talk about. Decision service management and business machines like you just said, problem.